Hola, como esta mi gente? I'm sorry, translators, I swear I'm not going to speak Spanish anymore. I come with a very heavy heart. Um, as I do, I think, with every time I'm given the opportunity to share stories and share power and resilience, because I don't view, view this as a, like, a transactional, one-channel sort of endeavor, but, you know, I'm giving energy, I'm getting energy, we're sharing energy. That's what we've been doing. And I'm bringing an offering. I'm bringing this altar, which sits in the Mission neighborhood of San Francisco, where a group of trans-Latina immigrant women are remembered and honored and who protect us. And I'm bringing them here to you so that you can laser this image, this altar, the women on the, on the wall, in your heart, because what we are facing, what we have faced, and what we are about to experience requires so much heart, so much hope. And it is literally asking of us to dig in the deepest well of possibility. I came into this work uh, not because I was recruited at some career fair, but out of sheer survival. Survival not just of myself, but of my people, of my community. Ruby Ardellana was a Nicaraguense trans Latina from Central America who brought me into this work. Her hope, her smile, her aspirations of a better life stay with me. The way that she was tragically murdered and her body strewn off the side of a road in an abandoned warehouse stay with me. The violence, the funerals, the vigils that I go to every single year stay with me because in doing that, I am reminded of the commitment, the commitment to my people, the commitment and what is required, even with the onslaughts of attacks, tweets, memos, the increased militarization, criminalization. And I hold this near and dear to my organizing strategy. The issues facing queer and trans people are not that far off from the issues that we face here. Government repression, surveillance, stigma, the journey to create safety without the police, without state violence. All of those things are faced by our folks who travel the incredible journey to come to the U.S for many reasons, including this idea of global democracy and the ways that we've exported democracy over the past several years in twisted ways. And we've messaged the US being leaders of, of, this, of these human rights values and values of justice. And in that, we've made the call. We actually have seen for, for quite a while the ways in which that has led folks to come to this country to seek a possibility, to seek refuge, to seek safety. And in particular, how that is important for queer and trans migrants who have faced so much discrimination from it, beginning from their home, by the government, by society, and lack of resources, only to be, and to be pushed out of that into the journey to travel, a travel that is also filled with so much sexual violence, only to end up at the border to be met with more resistance and more violence as what we've been witnessing and this administration being hell-bent on making that increasingly more difficult. Just yesterday, um, our friends over at the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security issued a new asylum rule um, and affirmed that the president has broad authority 
to suspend or restrict the entry of aliens into the U.S. if the President Trump determines it to be in the national interest to do so. I need to hear more boos when I, I was expecting boos. <laughs> so the assault on human rights is so critical, especially as caravans, especially as folks continue to migrate, not just from Central America, but from around the world, into the borders, not just the southern border, but borders all around us that have been man-made and created. And this strategy of attrition by this administration that is targeting vulnerable and religious groups and populations that we've been seeing and, and with this latest assault on asylees is so telling at the lengths at which this administration is willing to go in their pursuit to consolidate power and instill fear. Fear that is materialized into actions and hate and is not just stayed as rhetoric, but is materialized into murder and death. Roxana was a trans Latina, trans Hondureña, who left her home, her community, her family that loved her, because although her family loved her, although there was family acceptance, the community and the surrounding environment did not allow her to live, did not allow her to have the agency to be empowered and to carry out her life. Although her family pleaded with her not to leave, she said, I have no other choice. I can't find it. I am not allowed a job. I am not allowed health care. I'm not allowed to be me. And I'm putting you all at risk. So she head out by herself to join the caravan earlier this year and suffered quite a bit on, along the journey, not knowing exactly what she was going to walk into. And when she headed, when she ended up at Tijuana, at the border of Tijuana, she was met with more resistance by Customs Border Patrol in delaying and dissuading the migrants and trying to wear them down by the processing and taking their time, their sweet time, to do what they have always done and they know what to do. In all of this time, her health was deteriorating. Nobody knew. When they finally processed her, they put her um, in Yeleras, according to news reports. They put her in Yeleras for hours, hours and hours and hours, only to be put into another bus for hours and hours and hours to transport her to New Mexico. All of this under really, really cold temperatures. She died in ICE custody as a HIV positive trans woman. And her death is not singular. Her death is not anecdotal. Her death is one of intention by the state to erase us and to wipe us away in, in brutal, in brutality. I am reminded by her story being linked to Victoria Arellano, who in 2007 also died a gruesome death, handcuffed to her bed, pleading for her life, asking for more, for mercy and for medical attention. I bring these stories to you because these are the stories that have continued to fuel the community and continue to inform the strategy and continue to inform the ways in which our folks are thinking of building power and thinking of ending these systems for all of us, not just for our community, not just for queer and trans folks, but for all of us. We are offering an example, we are offering a strategy, we are offering stories because we see the devastation so clearly in our communities. And what has kept me going is been the resiliency and community power by our folks. It has been the ways in which I've seen the emergence of transnational orga organizing in this moment, where it can't just be the US alone, it can't just be our local communities alone, we can't just be having isolated conversations in Oakland, in New York. 
that the organizing has to be connected to something larger than ourselves. And we've seen that clearly. I've seen so many of these inspiring moments this year alone and for so many years that has inspired brand new leadership as you've seen today, including myself. We saw that clearly in New Mexico where queer and trans black and brown migrants gathered, not just to hold a rally, not just to gain consciousness, but they also built art. They also went to visit detention centers. They did this in three days. They sat together in rooms like this. They built across differences. And they were strategizing how to close detention facilities in their local communities and end contracts with ICE, as we've seen in Richmond, Santa Ana, Phoenix, Atlanta, and San Francisco. Because that is building, that, that movement of closing detentions, ending contracts is, is building. And we have to continue to support those endeavors in our local communities and become aware of those ways in which the collusion with ICE and police are deteriorating safety for our communities. So I want to end two ways. One, to recognize I was here a couple years ago. And I started, um, I was on, a, I think I was on a, it was a plenary, and I started my portion with a, a quote about hope and that our communities don't have the luxury of hope, that we just, we need action. But I think since then, and all that I've realized, all the spaces that I've shared in, I've realized actually the strategy of this administration and how fear is the strategy of choice has been made very clear by this administration. And that hope is our solution to innovate, to inoculate. And hope is only found through community and is only found through people power. And so sticking to that and sticking to our chants and sticking to our prayers and sticking to remembering the land and remembering our ancestors is needed now more than ever. So I want to close with a chant. I'm going to teach you a little bit of Spanish. And like always, we, you know, when you learn a new language, what do you first learn? The cuss words, right? So, <laughs> so when I say chinga, you, you say la migra, okay? So I, actually, I'm going to be cussing. You're not going to be cussing, technically. So when I say chinga, you say la migra. Chinga. La migra. Chinga. When I say chinga, you say la migra, chinga, la migra. chinga, la migra. chinga. La migra. gracias. <laughs>